a little bit about some of the essential background issues related to elder abuse. I'm going to set the stage, I'm going to give you a definition, I'm going to talk about where abuse occurs, who suffers, the causes, some just information about legislation, and I'm going to ask how much we do care. And then later in the day, I'm going to present uh, something called a true solution. So I hope you'll all come back for that. So first of all, how many of you, and I'm asking everyone here, including the people working on the project, how many of you are aging? <laughs> yeah? We all are, aren't we? We start aging from the day we're born. And so this is an issue for everyone. This is not just an issue for older adults. This is an issue for everyone. And how long do you want to live? You know, sometimes I ask that question and I get people saying, well, I want to live to be over 100. Other people say, well, not so long. And I'm not really asking you to call out the answers. I'm asking you to think about it. How long do you want to live? And what sort of old age do you want? And what do you fear about aging? So people talk about... Um, <clears throat> being afraid of being dependent on people, being afraid of getting sick, being afraid of being asked to move into an institution. And these are the things I hear over and over and over again. And I understand the fear. I've heard it from a lot of people. And, you know, I'm getting gray hair now, too. <laughs> I say getting. My hair is gray. And... Um, so I understand on a personal level, too, some of those fears. But I think there are many, many things we can do to counteract those fears and to deal with life in a way that's more positive, that helps us to have more say in terms of the kind of life we have in the future. And I just encourage you to not not give in to those kinds of feelings, to seize the moment and... Do what you can, and uh, there's lots of people around that are interested in helping you to figure that out. So the definition that I use, and some of the other presenters will give you other definitions, they're all similar, <clears throat> but the, pla the place that my definition differs is from the, the uh, red statement, the position of trust. This comes from the Ontario Association of Social Workers Handbook. Elder abuse is any action by a person in a, in a position of trust, a friend, family member, neighbor, or paid caregiver, which causes harm to a senior. It's that position of trust that makes it different. Um, because when you're trusting your, your, your family member or your paid caregiver to provide you care, you're making yourself vulnerable and, to them, and um, so it's abusive. Uh, so that's the definition that I use. There are four different kinds of abuse, physical abuse, psychological abuse, financial, and neglect. And there are other related issues as well uh, connected to society and families. Physical abuse. This includes these things, and I'm sure these are not surprises to you, and I'm not going to read every single one of them because you can see the, uh, the slide. But um, to point out that you have the right to say no to these things, you know, if it's uh, someone um, trying to get you to eat, eat something you don't want to eat, you have a right to say no. And uh, it's like any other kind of abuse in that way. Elder abuse is in some ways similar to spousal abuse similar to child abuse, although there are differences between it and child abuse, and I'll get to that. Psychological abuse is treating older people as children, bullying them, calling them names, uh, scolding, shouting, threatening, intimidating, removal of decision-making power without the legal right to do so. Psychological uh, abuse is harder to prove than physical abuse, but it's also a lot more common.
Financial abuse is, is one of the most common kinds of elder abuse. And this is where a, position, a person in a position of legal trust might withhold money, uh, force an older person to sell their property, or demand changes in the, in the will. The theft of money and possessions by an institutional worker is also abuse. There's also the misuse of funds. Uh, these are things that uh, when you sign a power of attorney, and uh, one of our presenters will talk about that, it's very important that you choose someone that you can trust, that you really can trust. I don't put fraud in the same category because usually fraud is, you know, the person trying to sell you a vacuum cleaner or something that's overpriced. Um, that comes under, it's certainly a crime, but it's just not counted in my way of defining elder abuse as elder abuse. Neglect. This is where older people are denied adequate nutrition or medical attention or left in unsafe or isolated situations. And um, you may see inadequate hygiene, withholding from medical services, etc. Now some of these definitions really don't apply to you because you got here, uh, you're involved in this program, and you're very capable. Some of them apply to people who are not as capable, who are having some problems, and they're not always able to say no. Or if they say no, people don't pay attention. So some of these items are not apt to be an issue for you. Where does it occur? Well, it happens in private. It happens in personal homes, in family settings, in the community, in caregiving settings, in institutions, and in long-term care facilities. You know, it's fundamentally a relationship issue, and so wherever a relationship happens, it happens. Who suffers? We all suffer. <clears throat> Future generations suffer because they're learning, they're learning a different way of relating to people than what is ideal. So we all suffer. There are three contributors to violence, and violence, I'm using that term kind of loosely, but it really relates mostly to physical abuse. And one of them is the societal belief, and that's where I come to ageism. Um, if society doesn't have enough respect for the group of people, if um, the psychology of the individuals involved and if the community response are not adequate, then, then this becomes a problem. There are individual, family, organizational uh, aspects to elder abuse. There's also society's abuse of power <clears throat> and society ageism. I don't know. Yeah, I guess that's not too bad in terms of size. Some of the issues that are impacted, and you know, we often think of elder abuse as uh, a family member or caregiver abusing the parent. Simple, right? The person, maybe they want money from their parent, or maybe um, it's an, a relationship that's had abuse in it all along. There may be a number of causes, but we don't always think about the fact that sometimes elder abuse happens where you've got a family member who has been caring for their child all their life. And when they become 85, it's harder to provide care. And sometimes the abuse happens there, where the child is mentally ill, or the child has emotional issues, the child is unemployed, the child is addicted, and these things also can be uh, related to elder abuse. It's not a simple story at all. For caregivers, uh, there are financial obligations, too many expectations, too much work, conflicting demands. 
Sometimes siblings don't agree as to what should be done. Um, sometimes caregivers are absent. You might have one child providing care and the other children are all out of reach and not available to help. And so all the burden falls to that one child. But there are things that can be done about that. You know, you can have people come and help you to um, have a family conversation where the outsider, I do this actually, but so do a lot of other people, where the outsider comes in, a professional, who helps you to talk to each other and uh, helps to make the point that each child needs to carry some responsibility, that it can't all be left to one child. So these are not insurmountable problems, but you need to contact the right people to get assistance. Fear of aging, I miss that one. <clears throat> Caregivers are afraid of aging too. And so that impacts the way they relate to their older people. Now we're getting a little bit to uh, some of the societal things where care levels are too high, but there's not enough services. So there's not enough um, health professionals and so on to offer the services that are needed where there's high levels of care. And that then puts people more at risk. So we have older people providing care, <clears throat> and we have older people that would actually prefer abuse to institutionalization. If people have only one caregiver and uh, that person is the abuser, well, sometimes people just don't want to face any alternatives. They'd rather deal with their child, if it is their child, than to um, get involved outside of that. And that sometimes escalates the problem. Um, there's a lack of knowledge, generally. Caregivers themselves don't understand aging. They don't understand what kind of care is required. And so the stress level goes up. And we all know about stress these days, right? How many of you know about stress? <coughs> Some of you, not all. <laughs> There's changes in care levels and emotional overload. Um, there's a poor level of health and social services available sometimes to the older person. And these things all create a situation where elder abuse can develop. And you know the fights that your children had in the sandbox? They will have those again as you become old, as we start to relate to uh, <clears throat> older people, for some reason, all those conflicts that we used to have with our brother in the sandbox resurface. And of course, older people are trying to hang on to their autonomy and their authority in their life. How many of you are trying to hang on to your autonomy and your authority? I sure am. Yeah. And uh, we need to educate the people around us, hence the train the trainers, we need to educate the people around us and society of the need that we have to remain in control of our life. And you can remain in control of your life for a very long time. Societal background. There's lots of things that happen in society that impact uh, the environment for uh, elder abuse. One is power imbalances, and I've just mentioned that, where the children and the parents or the, or the partner and the other partner are trying to wrestle with who's in charge of what, you know? Who is it that gets the groceries? Who is it that uh, makes sure that uh, all the resources are there for their parent. The models of health care also influence uh, the evolution of elder abuse. There are lots of people that are prepared to do assessments and um, support people as they encounter problems in their life. There's not enough people to help to build our strengths and help us to hang on to our strengths. And you can all play a role. You need to let people know around you that you have strengths and that you have all kinds of abilities 
and that you're going to play these out in your life. There are decision-making issues. As sometimes it, when we get older, we, um, we talk less and uh, sit in the corner more. And I just encourage you to speak up and say what you want and uh, take control of your life because you have the right to do that. If we have society, uh, stereotypes, if you have stereotypes about older people, and if you're saying things like, well, I'm old, or I'm having a senior moment, or, oh, maybe I have Alzheimer's. If you're doing that, other people will do that. You're teaching other people to have the stereotype. Don't do it. My favorite line is it's not about age. When people say to me, oh, I must be getting old, or I've got a sore knee, I must be getting old, I always retort, it's not about age. It's about something in that joint that's wrong. It's about some kind of perhaps a vascular problem that's influencing the flow of blood in your body. It's not about age. It is not about age. I don't buy it. <clears throat> legislation, these are all the uh, pieces of legislation that are involved with elder abuse. They don't all identify elder abuse specifically, but they all help us to deal with it. So there is a ton of legislation around, and we don't need more. And if anybody wants that slide, I'd be happy to send it to them. And Mary's putting this uh, presentation up along with all the rest uh, on a web page. So you should be able to access this material well. Some people argue that we need adult protection legislation, protection that will protect adults from elder abuse in the same way that we have legislation to protect children. Well, adults are not children. And uh, if we give away the authority to do that, we're somehow diminishing the um, power and control that older people have. Now, I'm not talking right now about people who are institutionalized, who are uh, have capability problems. I'm not talking about people that are unable to make their own decisions. I'm talking about people like you who are able to make your own decisions. You have a right to make your own decision. And you have a right to call for help when you need it. And there's lots of legislation you can call on if you need it. There are arguments for and against uh, <coughs> adult protection legislation. Mostly it's about the rights and privileges that older people have and their right to be self-determining and make their own decisions. That's not to say that the help isn't available. It is available. All you need to do is ask for it. Now, ageism. What are some examples of ageism in our society? What have you seen? What have I seen? You know, recently I stopped dyeing my hair. And uh, I found that I got a different reaction from people when I had gray hair. Interesting, very interesting. Went to a drugstore not too long after, dying, after stopped dyeing my hair and someone called me dear. <laughs> And I said, I, I stared at the shelf in front of me for a minute, thinking, am I going to respond or not? Because, of course, this is my field of practice, right? So I felt I needed to respond, so I told, turned around and I said, please don't call me dear. <laughs> uh, I don't think she really understood why. But it's a beginning, you know? You don't have to, you don't have to accept those things. You too can say it's not about age.
I invite you to think about examples of ageism. So there, we call older people senior citizens. Why do we add the word citizen? Is that because we're not quite sure that older people are citizens? We don't call younger people younger citizens, right? So why do we call older people senior citizens? Just a question to think about. We have organizations that are mandated and paid to provide care, but there's not enough money to provide adequate care. So what does that say? What does that say about our society? There's a thing called the comfort allowance that people have when they live in a long-term care facility. Every person is supposed to have a minimum amount of money each month to buy ice cream cones and <laughs> whatever, you know, treats, newspapers. Sorry? Not enough? Is that what someone said? Yeah. For many, many years it was 112. Recently it's gone up to 116, but it's not enough. And other things get purchased out of that money now. So that's an example of ageism. The food allowance in long-term care facilities until 2000 was just over $5, about $5.50 a day, and that allowed two choices. In prisons at the same time, it was $11.46. Now it's gone up now. It's much improved now. I, I don't know the exact rate right now, but it's much improved. But that's another example of what ageism looks like. Is, is, is this what the government pays? Yes. You in an institution or? This is the amount of money um, that, so you pay, if you live in an institution, this is a little bit of a diversion, but if you live in an institution, um, you have to pay a certain amount from the pensions you get from the government, right? Most of it. If you get the regular uh, amount of money that the lowest income earner gets. And this is a portion of that that is set aside for the individual resident to be able to spend themselves. That's what it is. So you can pay your haircuts and so on. But there are a lot of stories related to that that I can't really go into right now. But there are things that are covered by the comfort allowance that didn't used to be. If you go, if you're web savvy and you go onto the web, you will be able to see, if you type in comfort allowance, you'll get information. And, and so the institution isn't supposed to be taking money out of there for their purposes, it's just strictly for what you want and need. Yeah, unless you agree. <laughs> unless you agree, um, yes, unless you agree that you're going to have something done. So, for instance, if you want to have your hair cut come out of that money, you can make an agreement with the institution and they would take the money from that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's complicated. Elder abuse is not as simple as it might seem. Now, these are some quotes from a study I did a while back, and these are just average Canadians responding to questions when I asked them to talk about their relationships with older adults. I also think that they're seen as non-contributors anymore. I mean, how does this society define success? Maybe we no longer see them as contributing and successful. My mother, it is interesting, always wanted to be useful. As she gets older, she's less able to be useful. So do we then see her as less than because she can no longer do what she used to do? I think we define people by whatever they still can do, whatever we think needs doing. But you see, that's a problem with our society. Why do we define people in that kind of way? There's other benefits people have. I was thinking about our subdivision. There are no elderly people there all young families. And so we don't build areas to live where it's conducive for all ages. And so when you have people compartmentalized and living away from each other, you do lose respect. You don't know and understand each other. I think that because they're old people, they all get put in the same category, even though they're all very different. And so they have less power. 
but I think they still have a little more than the person who's not doing as well physically because at least they have the power to stay out of the hospital is what this person said. And this was a caregiver who was looking after her aged mother <clears throat> who was cognitively impaired. And her siblings said they think it's a waste of my life to care for my mother. She's not functional, very functional. They wouldn't spend this amount of their life doing this kind of care. So there's a value issue. You see, this is what we need to fix. This is fixable. This is people's attitude. We need public education to teach people about the competence of older adults. Older people, as you demonstrate by being here, have a tremendous amount to offer our society. And we need to start paying attention to that because we're losing rich resources that we need to take advantage of. How much do we care? Do we care enough? Do you care enough to say to your families, it's not about age, it's not about age. So I will be back later in the day, but I am going to uh, leave the podium for the next person.